My name is Kathy Hoyt and I serve as the Executive Director of Section 5 and I want to welcome all attendees today to our virtual workshop for, uh, that was uh, assembled by our Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Um, I'm going to turn it right over to one of our Advisory Committee members, Brigham, who is a three-sport athlete at Penn Yan, and this is his second year with uh, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. So Brigham, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Ms. Hoyt said, my name is Brigham, and I'm a senior at Penn Yan Academy. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, um, head athletics coordinator and head softball coach at Herkimer College, Mr. Peter Anadio. On top of his duties at Herkimer, PJ is a pro softball coach and the COO and owner of Clutch Performance. During his tenure as the Herkimer softball coach, he has acquired an overall record of 404 wins and 83 losses on his way to 11 straight conference championships, 10 straight regional championships, and a national championship in 2013. Coach PJ has also coached 30 at All-Americans and above all else, loves his job and his players. Please join me in welcoming Coach PJ Anadio. Thank you for that introduction, Brigham. Um, your check is in the mail, buddy. I appreciate that. Um, so I just got to share with you guys, looking at my notes this morning, my, my wife and, and son added a couple things into my bio um, on my notes, and they wanted me to share that. Uh, I am a chicken wing loving, chocolate milk chugging, country music listening, and Chevy Silverado driving model American too. So um, I told them that I'll add that in once I caught it this morning. So, um, but no, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, hopefully you guys get something out of um, our message. Um, I wish I was coming to you live from Herkimer College, but um, just like no one uh, in this world um, is exempt from, from COVID, I have uh, been quarantined. Um, right now, while we go through some additional testing, and I'm coming to you live from my dining room and kitchen area right now. So uh, thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited to be here and excited to share my message with you. Uh, if we can go ahead and start that slideshow, that would be fantastic. You're muted, PJ. There you go. Oh, can you guys hear me now? Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. Um, so the title of my slideshow today is COVID Hangover. It's something that we've been preaching to our student athletes here on Herkimer College campus that, um, you know, we're just trying to get them in a different mindset in a different place um, with their thought process, um, with their energy, their body language and how they're carrying themselves on campus so they can uh, achieve their goals. Um, you know, obviously we're always willing to negotiate the path that we take to achieve our goals, but our goals should never uh, wander and, and they should never differ. So um, if we can go ahead and get to the next slide, please, I appreciate it. Um, just so you guys um, uh, believe me a little bit that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Um, this wasn't really updated and I apologize for that, but. Uh, last year, our program had another huge year, making it to the national championships again. Won our 400th game um, as a program, which is fantastic. We're now at 11 straight conference championships, 10 straight region three championships, uh, 10 straight college world series appearances. Um, and my assistant decided to put that funny guy at the bottom, brushing his shoulders off. So next slide, please. Um, put on this next slide with the heartache, despair, um, and COVID. There's no prejudice. There's no favorites. There's no boundaries. It knows no race. It knows no ethnicity, no gender or color. Um, no one, and I mean no one, is exempt from what has been going on. Um, no question, no doubt, but it's about your mindset. Um, and I will leave you with something that my mentor gave to me at the beginning of this school year. Um, and I have it sitting right on my desk, and I want to share this. Um, average people let life dictate their attitude while the elite true leaders let their attitude and positivity determine their day in life. Um, I think that that was really huge. Um, you know, sometimes you just need some words that, that get you um, out of a funk or in a different um, negative thought process or whatever that is. And, and that was really huge for me. And I wanted to share that with you guys today. Um, you know, I said to one of my girls last week that you've come too far and you've healed too much. 
not to raise the bar on who has access to your energy. And you guys need to understand that, um, that, that your energy and, and your aura is precious and it belongs to you. And you should really, really be mindful of who you're letting have access to that um, because that, that determines so much on, on your day-to-day um, achievements and your day-to-day um, goals and, and the projects you're trying to achieve. And you know, whether it's your homework or if it's on the, on the practice field or in a game situation, um, your energy is really important and make sure that you, uh, you keep that under lock and key and, and, and you're being very choosy on, on who has access to that. Um, who's on your team? <laughs> That's a message that I send to all student athletes, no matter where I'm speaking. Um, I say to them all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Um, beautiful thing to be able to pick your friends. It's just, you have to make sure you're choosing wisely. Um, you have to understand that um, who you surround yourself with, you're going to be associated with. And, you know, if, if you're hanging out in a, in a restaurant with a bunch of bank robbers, you're going to be considered a bank robber too. And, and, and I need you guys to, and obviously I, I take that as a, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a joke with the bank robber thing, but you know, you have to understand that, um, you know, you're going to be grouped in to that setting. So as I tell my, my softball team, if one girl goes out and does one thing, it, 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 it mirrors all of us. We're all included and lumped into that. So, and, and you guys know that, um, you know, praise comes in, in drops and, and trust comes in drops, but you can lose all that by the buckets. You know what I mean? So I, I think that we need to be precious with that. I think that we need to hold that near and dear to us. If you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I get to the, uh, I'm on the wrong one. Can we go back one? There you go. Yep. Um, I put bam. Um, we're going to hit you right between the eyes with it, guys. Um, this COVID thing, while we want to move carefully and we want to be calculated still, it's time to get over it. It's time to move forward. Um, it's right now o'clock. Not now, but right now. It's time to jump back in the saddle, guys, and take the reins and take back control of your life and your future. Um, it's, you guys have an opportunity of a lifetime. You guys have to understand the lifetime of that opportunity. I told my girls right now, and, and, and we're achieving and we're succeeding at an immense rate at Herkimer College right now. Our kids have wrapped their mind around this, and they have the right mindset, and they have the right attitude. And I, I give kudos to all their coaches and our leadership on our campus. Um, but right now is the time to stand out amongst the crowd. While everyone else is doing the minimum amount of work and, and looking for handouts and looking for ways out of things, um, right now you can stand out and make a name for yourself by being that person that's thinking differently, acting differently, and being a go-getter. And instead of looking um, for an excuse, look for a way. You know, we say that all the time, and it's about, it's about priorities. If it means something to you, you're going to find a way. If it doesn't, you're going to continue to find an excuse. And really, excuses do nothing but justify failure, guys. Um, a great quote that was shared uh, amongst my team, uh, one of my players um, put this up about not taking anything for granted. We talk about pain. And as athletes, we endure a lot of pain, guys. You know, whether you, you break a, a bone, you know, you twist an ankle, you know, you hurt your back or whatever it is. Um, those hurt, but there's no pain like the pain of regret. And those who died yesterday, the quote was this, those who died yesterday had plans this morning. Those that died this morning had plans for tonight. Don't take life for granted. Live and love. Tell the people that you want um, to know that you love them, that you love them. Um, live your life and you may never get the chance again. Um, so we've been really trying to go about our business. Everything that we do, whether it's our homework, a project, um, a community service project or taking an opportunity in a game to help our team become victorious, we're, we're giving it our best shot right then and there and not, not waiting for any chances or not leaving it up to chance or taking anything for granted. Next slide, please. Relatability. Um, we're all in the same boat, guys. That's what I was trying to say earlier. Um, we have to be willing to change. And I shared this in the... Uh, state leadership conference that I did back in March. Um, this is a quote from Albert Einstein. And it says, the significant problems that we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking in which we created them. Um, that's a, from a book called How to Survive Change. 
Um, you know, it's just a great quote and it really helps you wrap your head around it. Um, you know, the one thing is I've been trying to get my kids to understand is to lose the sense of entitlement that we're not special. Um, the next person, the person next to you, the person across from you is going through the same things. Your coach, your teacher may be going through the same things that we all are. Um, I think that if we could have some sympathy and some empathy and some compassion, um, you know, I think that'll be huge for your, for you guys going forward. Um, as a society, for us collectively going forward. And, you know, I thought this was fantastic. I actually saw this on Twitter. If we only fought just as hard to understand as we do to disagree, how much better of a world would this be, right? I need you guys to wrap your head around that. I'm going to say it one more time. If we only fought just as hard to understand each other and one another as much as we do to disagree, how much better would this world be? Um, and that's the one thing I ask my kids is, is to no matter what it is you're doing, leave it better than you found it. And that's why I coach guys. I'm hoping to send out 20 new girls every year that have that mindset to leave this world just a little bit better than they found it. Um, another one that one of our girls shared, and I want to share with you. Um, with all that going on, we have to understand, we must make sure that the ugly in others doesn't kill the beauty in all of us. We can't be jaded. In, in decisions or just because maybe we got burned once, um, we have to make sure that, that we, we keep shining on. Um, you know, one of our models from two years ago was, uh, we wanted to shine so brightly, not by dimming the light of others, um, but by, by doing what we're supposed to do at all times so we can pave the way and light a path for others to follow. Um, I think that, that speaks volumes about um, our type of kids and our character on our campus. Um, so hopefully you guys get something out of that. Um, and lastly, um, we've had some despair um, on our campus. You know, we, we've lost some people due to COVID. Um, some, some that were expecting, some that were a shock. Um, and, and the last one that was shared by a young lady um, on our team. Sadly, sometimes you will never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Um, I think that that really woke me up a little bit. Um, sometimes again, we take things for granted and, you know, we need to have an attitude of gratitude and, and be in the moment and be where your feet are and appreciate the time that you are having with people. Um, whether it's just a simple conversation or, you know, a, a holiday with a family member, no matter what it is, um, you know, be where your feet are and give that, that person all of yourself. I, I think everyone deserves that. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, time to evolve. I think that's really big. Um, we cannot be afraid of losing people along the way that you outgrow guys. Um, I think that that comes with uh, maturity and maturation. And um, that's one thing that is hard for people to, to let go, um, to start new friendships. But sometimes we have to understand when things are, are coming to a dead end, whether it's a, a job, a position, a relationship, um, a significant other, whatever that is we have to have that mindset of, of growth and we can't be afraid of losing the people along the way that, that sometimes we outgrow. But I'm going to tell you this, with that being said, we have to be afraid of losing yourself, trying to please everybody in your lives. Um, I, I'm a people pleaser. I try to do everything I can for every person that I can, but at the same time, I got to make sure that I keep my eye on my priorities. And it's not so much time management for me, it's priority management making sure that I'm putting my son and wife first and then my team and then my coworkers and, and everything, my team at work as well. So um, it's just a, it's a mindset thing. Um, I'm going to challenge you guys to, to want to be different um, from and stand out for everyone else. And, you know, if you want different for yourself, you have to start moving, acting and thinking differently. Old keys do not unlock new doors, guys. And, and, and that's the one thing that we try to focus on as our kids are trying to evolve and become um, the people, the athletes, the students that they've always dreamt of becoming. Um, so please hold that with you near and dear to you. Uh, if we can go on the next slide, please. Um, I, I'm, I'm, out of today, I want to try and get more interaction with you guys, more than me just sitting here and lecturing at you. Um, so I'm looking forward to that question and answer. I'm at the end, so I got a couple more things for you guys, and then I'm going to open it up for you. Excuse me. Sorry, I lost my spot here. So uh, leadership, since this is a leadership conference, 
that's one thing that I feel like that we do really well at Herkimer College is teaching leadership, what it is, what it isn't, um, how you how you attain it, how you maintain it, how you can lose it. Um, I think that that our leadership training on our campus is why we've had so much success as a college with our teams. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, out of our 19 athletic teams, all 19 made the region three playoffs. Um, we had 12 teams out of 19 that were ranked top 10 in the country at one point, which was pretty cool. So um, some things that I want to share with you guys. Uh, so three truths about leadership. I'm a big John Gordon fan. I don't know if any of you guys know him, but he wrote The Energy Bus and a couple other books that we read. Um, leadership isn't about gaining power. It's about empowering others. And I think that if you really have that mindset, um, you're going to do big things in life. And I say it all the time. If, if you're too little, or I'm sorry, if, if you're too big to do little things on our campus or on our team or within our program, you're going to be too little to do big things in life. And I think that if you have that mindset about leadership and it's about um, getting the best out of everyone around you and, and putting people in position to shine and, and to grow and to be at their very best, you're going to have a great, great career in front of you. Uh, great leaders become great leaders because of the greatness they bring out in all those around them. Um, I try to bring that to my team all the time. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is, is operating at their highest level. And, you know, if we, we all talk about wanting to be great. Every kid that comes in my program wants to be an All-American. Every kid wants to be um, the next scholarship award winner. But if they understand that if they have that true servant leadership, which is what we're going to do next, and they serve 20 others to, to the best of their ability, and they're trying to bring out their greatness, when your time comes and you have 20 people trying to pick you up and lift you up, think of the power behind that instead of just one or two people uh, that you can always just rely on or count on. So um, please remember that with you too. And lastly, um, for leadership, you don't have to be great to serve, but you have to serve to be great. And please, in anything that you guys do, whether it's a boss or, or a team captain, um, or when you go down to your college and you know if you're an RA, or you have your fraternities or whatever it is, please have that servant leadership mindset, guys. Um, when, when you do that, it just comes back to you tenfold. And that's how, how life is beautiful. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, um, you know, obviously we have uh, young athletes and, and young female athletes that struggle um, from a day-to-day -day basis mindset or, you know, with um, um, confidence or whatnot. And, and we always tell them that when you do for others, it always makes you feel good. You know, so that's one thing when, when, when our kids are starting to hit a wall, they're going through a little bout of depression, go do things for other people. When you make other people happy genuinely and you can feel the, the sincerity and you, can, and you can sense the warmth in their smile, it's really an amazing feeling, guys. And that's how you can start to feel better about yourself when you're doing for other people. And that, to me, is true leadership. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Lastly, a um, couple of things I want to share with you guys. Um, a coach once told me that the mo two most important days of your life are the day that you're born and the reason that you find out why. Um, I have been lucky enough and fortunate enough to experience both. Um, I live to coach. I'm not, uh, I love all sports. It's not just about softball for me. I love having the ability to um, impact people's lives. And when I thought back on, on my life and the people that had the biggest impact, it was my coaches. Um, so when I, find, when I found my calling, that it wasn't owning a bar and a restaurant, that it was actually um, being in a school setting and, and, and lifting kids up and, and helping kids find their way, um, I found out um, what my passion was. And if that's one thing I always strive to implore is for people to find their passion. I have not worked a day in 15 years, guys. Um, I can't wait to get to campus. I can't wait to drive up that hill. Um, and the one thing that I try to remember every day is that happiness is an inside job. I can't expect other things or other people to make me happy. I have to own that piece. And if I do that, then I'm going to be my best version of myself. And that's one thing I ask my athletes all the time. 
is just just be your best version of yourself day in and day out. And I think that in the end, when you look back on every experience, you can be happy about that. Um, we try not to chase success at Herkimer College. Um, we try to decide on making a difference. And if you do that, success eventually will find you. Um, it kind of just hitches a ride. We aim for significance rather than aiming for success. Um, attitude of gratitude. We live it. We talk it. We preach it. We actually walk it. We take a gratitude walk all the time in, the, in our athletic department. Coaches, you'll see go for a stroll all the time, just taking that gratitude walk. And, and when you genuinely have that, and it came from a book by John Gordon called The Energy Bus, um, it's really, really incredible feeling. Um, and, and it empowers you um, to be your, your very best, whether it's a player, whether it's a teammate, whether it's a student, a son or a daughter, um, a parent, whatever that is. Um, it, it really is an incredible feeling. And lastly, the last thing I want to share with you guys um, is a slide that I, I saw at a coaching clinic um, that kind of just woke me up a little bit. Uh, and, and our slide was the real tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon that we wait so long to begin it. I implore you guys to live, do the things that you want to do, um, and be the person that you always wanted to be before it's too late. So I just want to say thank you. Um, that's my, my message to you guys today is to, um, you know, like I said, it, it's time to move on, move forward, upward and onward. And um, I hope that um, I read about your guys' success. And if there's anything that I can do to be a part of your guys' success, um, I am always here. Um, you know, and if anyone wants to, uh, you know, I, I keep hearing about Section 5. I haven't really spent a lot of time out there. But I got to tell you guys, people in my office keep talking about garbage plates and a, and a beef on whack or something like that. Um, I don't know what those are. So the first school that invites me out personally that has that for lunch, I'm your guy. I'll be there for you guys. So. Um, but now I'm going to open it up for a little question and answer um, session now, because this is the part that I want is, um, you know, to be a little more in interactive and answer your guys' questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, Kathy. Yeah. So at this time, if uh, we'll have you type in um, questions into the chat and I'll ask them and then PJ can answer them. We have about eight to 10 minutes uh, with PJ. Awesome. Um, so let's take advantage of his time with us because I know he has to hop off after his session because he's got things to attend to. Um, let's see. So I'm going to go here. Um, Mark Blankenberg writes, Coach, great presentation. You mentioned some books. Can you share those titles again with us? Uh, absolutely. So I'll, I'll share some of the books that we're going to read this year as a team. Uh, one of them is The Energy Bus by John Gordon. Um, that is an absolute must. That's the first book I read with every team. So my players will hear it twice in their career. Um, and, and they get something new out of it um, every year. And, and John Gordon's got a series of books. And, and sometimes I sprinkle in some other ones. One's The Seed. The other one is The Carpenter. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost you guys. I apologize. Um, <laughs> another one that he has is called um, Training Day which is absolutely fantastic as well. So he's got all sorts of books out there. Um, another one that we, that we just read is called Make Your Bed, um, which is by the colonel that delivered the graduation speech to the University of Texas. I'm sure that, that you guys have seen that online. Um, well, he wrote a book and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but that is one of the best books that I've ever read to, to my team as well. It was just very eye-opening. Um, another one that we really buy into, um, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna hold it up right here because I have it here. This is called What Drives Winning. Um, this is one of the books that have changed our culture here. This is by Brett Ledbetter. Um, he's absolutely amazing. And there's a workbook that goes with that. And um, that we, we probably do something at least two, three times a week out of this book and, and building our culture. Um, one other one I wanna share with you guys is this is called The Culture Code. Um, this book is absolutely fantastic. I actually just started this about a quarter way the thr through, um, and it's been been eye opening, um, pretty gripping too. So, um, and this is by Daniel Coyle. Um, so those are some books that you guys can, can check out, and please um, feel free to uh, drop me an email um, or even on social media. Um, you know, there's the instant messaging on all those. Um, I'd love to have conversations. 
you see me on late at night because when I get here, I'm uh, I'm digging up more material for the next day, the next weeks. So anytime you see me on those platforms, please drop me a message and please feel free feel free to to add me or follow me or friend me, whatever you want to say. Those things. We have another um, one here that you could probably speak for hours on, and we've talked about this at our student athlete advisory committee meetings. What expectations do you have for your team captains? Ooh, you know, I try to implore, implore them to find their way. So one of the things that um, I thought were really uh, eye-opening and it helped me make some changes in how I teach and, and how I not only just teach softball, but teach the leadership part is let them make some mistakes every now and then. You know, we, we get so caught up in having to be perfect and we can't let them fail, but sometimes letting them fail is letting them achieve. Sometimes it's finding out what not to do that lets that sit, sink in and sit with you. Um, it's just like, you know, as a parent, um, I, I try to pride myself in not being that bulldozer or lawnmower parent that people talk about right now. I want my son to find his way. I'll show him, I'll guide him. I will teach him what it looks like. Um, I'll teach him how to get there. And then I turn it over to him and I say, find your way. And sometimes he's got, he takes some wrong turns and he's got to backtrack and, and to get back to that point he was at where he took a right, maybe he needed to take a left there. Um, little things like that. So um, I, I know our Navy SEALs, who I think is the ultimate team of any team has taken more of an approach that way because they were, they do great in training but they are subpar when it comes to real life situations because they're becoming so dependent upon their, their captains, their, their trainers or whoever it is, whatever you want to say. And for me as a coach, I started to realize that my kids, every move they would make would look for my approval. And that's not how I want to coach. Um, I want to let them know it's okay to find their way and to have their own thought processes um, and to make some mistakes along the way. Um, so that way, you know, when it comes May 28th and we're playing for a national championship, we're the best version of ourselves. Good question, Mark. That's fantastic. So with my leaders, um, it really comes down to one thing. Be a great person. Be a great human being. Um, be a great teammate and friend. Um, I think that when you stick to those principles, um, your leadership is always going to come through as genuine. Um, and to use us, when you need some, some guidance. Um, we're certainly going to set our leadership up. Um, and, and there's things that we might be privy to as coaches that maybe our, our student leadership isn't privy to. And that's okay. You know, Just because they're a captain doesn't mean they should know everything about every kid in every situation. So sometimes it's good when they come to us for, for some guidance and asking some questions, uh, when to push and when to pull back a little bit, things like that. Um, but realistically, guys, we don't have a lot of leadership issues because we preach person greater than player to our entire roster. Every kid is being worked on as far as their moral skills and their character skills. And it's making our leadership, um, our captain's job so much easier because everyone is truly buying into person greater than player. And that's what comes out of that. What drives winning book guys. So thank you. DJ Brigham has one for us. What is the most yep. What is the most fulfilling thing that comes along with coaching and being a leader for you personally? Oh man, uh, by far relationships. Um, I'm a coach. Listen, when it's all said and done and we've all met our maker and, you know, we all go to the same type of place and um, I don't get to bring a U-Haul behind that hearse that I'm in. Um, <laughs> so it's not about material things, guys. It's about the impact that you have, the relationships, the memories, um, that for me is why, um, I coach as well. And, and, you know, it's great. You know, we won a national championship, um, which was fantastic. That's the pinnacle. But honestly, I took more pride in the fact that when one of my, the, my first girl that ever signed a letter of intent to come to Herkmer and play softball for me, met her boyfriend that was a baseball player here on campus. And three years later, after they graduated, they called me and said, they just got engaged and how excited they were. And, I was one of their first phone calls, which I thought was awesome. And by the end of the conversation, they had asked me um, if I would um, become ordained as they wanted me to marry them um, was probably the most um, incredible thing I've ever, the most incredible honor I've ever received in my entire life. 
Um, so that to me is what it's all about, Bram. Um, that's an awesome question. Thank you. And I was very nervous hitting enter when I did my online um, uh, ordainment, whatever you want to say that was. <laughs> I'm going to give you one last question and then we'll okay. transition over to our next speaker. But this one, this one's interesting. Do you deal with any energy vampires or do, does your book Ooh. talks and culture eliminate that behavior? That is fantastic. And whoever asked that question must have read um, <laughs> the energy bus. Um, so yes, we do um, have some energy vampires every now and then because kids are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. And, and, you know, sometimes you get some kids that are from poisonous backgrounds that just don't know any differently. And sometimes, um, sometimes a kid needs the program more than the program needs the kid guys, please coaches hear that. Um, I don't just always keep the 20 or 24 best players or most talented players. Sometimes I know that there's a kid that could just really, really benefit from being around our program or being around our energy or being around our messages every day. You know, I would say the most important part of her practice is the 15 minute TED talk that we have every day before practice, more so than anything she's going to gain by gaining a few more ground balls or, you know, sometimes you know, I stick her in the bullpen to catch a bullpen for some pitchers. Um, you know, I think that it's really about the other stuff. So, um, you know, we do have to deal with so, some vampires every now and then, but through the process of what we do and how we teach, um, those vampires um, end up pouring their, the blood that they may have sucked early back into the team and breathing life into us. Um, I've had, I've had a whole team march into my office one time and, vouch to help this kid as long as I kept her on the team and you know she was on the cusp of getting caught and that really opened my eyes that this lady had come a long way because sometimes the players see a lot more than we do as coaches right so if every player was willing to march into my office and vouch for her I had then realized that that young lady was no longer a vampire that she was actually breathing life into us so some kids can change guys and I take that that job personally to, to help change them PJ, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Section 5, we appreciate the time that you spent with us. I do have one message for you from Crystal Kent at Waterloo Central School District. Crystal Kent? Awesome. Thanks. I love her. Thanks, Coach. Good to see you. Go Herkimer. <laughs> awesome. So, thank you, Crystal. I appreciate it. I'm a big fan of hers. I'm one of the best in the business, and uh, we're always playing for, for Waterloo softball, too. So I know that she's probably on to bigger and better things as AD now, I think. Um, but yeah. Sure so. Yeah. So again, yeah, thanks awesome. for, thank you, Crystal. Thanks for spending time with us. Um, and I'm sure I'll I'll be sharing your email out with all attendees today. So don't be surprised if you get some follow up questions or uh, student athletes that might want to reach out to you. If that's okay with you, um, please do. I would love to hear from you guys. Anything that I can do for you? Great, thank you. Um, at this time, all right, Kathy. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, absolutely. Have a great day. This. All right, you too. Bye, bye, guys. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Heather's coming to us live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Steelers fan. They had a big game last night and won. Um, Heather's slide presentation will be coming up here in a few minutes. And her first couple slides are going to tell you a lot about herself. So I'm not going to do any formal introduction besides welcome, Heather, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, um, happy to be here, everyone. My name is Heather Mangieri. I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit about um, sports nutrition and give you a little bit of background on me. I'm a sports and wellness dietitian. Um, you can actually, you know, go, move to the next slide. I'll have to do a little bit. Um, my roles and disclosures. Um, I am a nutrition consultant. I also do nutrition counseling. So I work one-on-one -on -one with athletes. And then I do a lot with nutrition communications and helping kind of spread the word of sports nutrition and how to fuel athletes. Um, and particularly, I have expertise and interest in younger athletes, high school, middle school age, uh, because this is the, the age where there's significant nutrition concerns, a lot of growth and development and changes going on. And on top of that, um, you know, the sports nutrition and all the training and competitions. 
Um, I am a spokesperson and a consultant for the American Dairy Association Northeast, um, who is, um, you know, ha has me here today. And um, I also am an editor for the um, Sports Nutrition Care Manual for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So basically, I do a lot of behind the work scenes, but I also work one on one with athletes and, and love talking to students in groups like I am today. Next slide. Okay, so to start, we're doing a polling question. Um, and I want to know what aspect of a student athlete's um, nutrition plan has the biggest impact on sports performance. So I'll just give a couple seconds for you guys to answer that. Anybody wants to give their, um, what they think would be the right answer? We only have one person so far that submitted. There's two. Okay. It's on the screen. <laughs> They're kicking in now, Heather. All right. You can see the results, correct, Heather, or no? I can't, no, nope, oh. I can't see the results. I just see the- um, the, the slide? Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, so just, yeah, just tell me what, tell me what the, the outcome is whenever you- Sure, I will. I'm gonna wait just another few seconds. We have 72% of our people participating. There's another entry. So 67% of the people said the food and beverages consumed part is as part of the regular meals and snacks that you eat. Okay. 11% said what you consume before practice or training. 0% okay. during practice and training. <laughs> Must be they don't get snack breaks. Yep. And then 22% after practice or training. All right. All right. Okay. Great. So I, I'm not actually going to give the answer, but I am hopeful of they're not. Now I can see the results. Yep. <laughs> Close that. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna hopefully by um, I'm gonna give you know talk a little bit and then hopefully you guys will be able to identify what the right answer is. But I will tell you eventually. So today I'm gonna talk about two things: day-to-day -day nutrition and also sports nutrition. And I have them as separate things because I want you to start to think about um, how they're different. So day-to-day -day nutrition is what an, a student um, or all of us really need to be eating each day. And for students, it's about health, but it's also about growth and development. So the, these are the foods um, that you eat for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and then any snacks that you have. And really the, the basis of your eating plan is to make sure that you're getting a wide variety of foods so that you're getting all of your vitamin and mineral requirements for the day. Um, and it also, because athletes, especially like student athletes, it, and when you're going through that growth and development period through middle school, high school, and, and, and kids in general, nutrition needs are, are pretty high. So that healthy eating plan also includes some extras like a favorite treat, you know, maybe you go out for ice cream or you have a cookie with your lunch. So it's really, it's really a, a, a part of that whole picture that does allow for some of your favorite treats and extras. Sports nutrition, I want you to think of as the extra foods and fluids that support specifically um, training, competition, and, and um, individual athlete goals. So this is kind of above and beyond what you would need just for health, growth, and development. But now we have the extra that support how often you're practicing and your competitions and training. And this is different for all athletes because everybody's gonna practice different, um, you know, some have an hour practice five days a week, others practice two hours a week, twice a week. So you have to, this is really individualized to the athlete, to the sport and to the goals. Um, these really what's in this is the foods you, you know, some athletes might meet this requirement by eating more foods at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, or by having extra snacks during the day, or by making sure that they consume something extra before, during, and after, um, training and competitions. Um, and then just, so I don't forget, I have to make sure that everybody hears loud and clear that sports nutrition involves healthy hydration and all of the fluids that you're consuming because athletes have a you know much higher fluid need than um, non-athletes. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so to start, let's just kind of go over the six essential nutrients. And this is day-to-day -day nutrition, right? We all need adequate carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And those are the energy providing nutrients. So you eat those foods, your body breaks them down and they provide energy for you to function, for you to walk, for you to move, for you to think. And then there's micronutrients. So those are the vitamins and minerals that are found within the carbs, proteins, and fats that we eat. And then the, the last essential nutrient is water. And we're going to go through each of these. I'm, I'm talking really fast because I want to, I have so much to share and I want to make sure that, um, you know, I kind of get through it. So you, yeah, you can go ahead with the slide. So to start with is carbohydrates. Hopefully you guys have heard of carbohydrates. Um, this is the, the nutrient found in breads and starches and starchy vegetables like potatoes and rice, um, sweet potatoes, corn, um, also non-starchy vegetables like carrots and broccoli, fruits, um, dairy foods like milk and yogurt, and then also sugars. So carbohydrates are the primary energy source of the body. So we eat, when, when you're eating these foods, you break them down, we digest them, we absorb them, and then the body is able to use them for energy for us to move. So the amount of carbohydrate that you consume is really, um, we have a baseline, but then if you're an athlete, you're really needing to consume more because you're expending more energy. Um, they also is the carbohydrates are also the preferred fuel source of working muscles. And that is because our muscles store carbohydrate. So we eat all these carbohydrates and then the, some of them get stored in the liver and then some of them get stored in our muscles. And the more muscle mass that you have, the more carbohydrate that you're able to store. And that's a really important concept for an athlete because muscle, um, the carbohydrate that's stored in muscle is what helps to fuel you during training and competition. So if you have, let's say a, a two hour soccer game, you eat carbohydrates before, muscles have um, full stores of carbohydrate. And then throughout that game, your body is going to be able to use that carbohydrate for energy so that you start the game with as much energy as you end with and kind of keeps you going. The more carbohydrate stores you have, the, the, the longer you'll be able to go with those energy with an energy source. Um, it's also the preferred fuel source of the brain. So when we talk about needing a minimum amount of carbohydrates, that's really thinking about how much does a student need to focus in school, to pay attention. We, you know, you know, I'm sure you've all heard breakfast is the more, most important meal of the day. And that's because we wanna make sure that you're starting the day able to focus and concentrate and comprehend and have memory skills. And carbohydrate is the fuel source that makes that happen. And then again, they're found in a wide variety of foods. Okay, next slide. Next, we'll talk about um, protein foods. Proteins are, um, you know, again, they're found in a lot of animal foods, animal products, but also plant-based foods. Protein is made up of amino acids and they are used to build and repair body tissues. So when we eat meat or poultry or fish and seafood, um, dairy products, um, cheese, yogurt and milk, eggs, and then plant-based sources are beans and legumes and also soy-based products. So think about protein as kind of like construction material. So you eat these foods and the body breaks them down into single amino acids and they're just kind of hanging out. And then the body says, oh, well, I need to build more muscle tissue. So it takes those amino acids and it assembles, it grabs the ones that it needs and it's able to build more, more muscle. But it's not just muscle. Really, we're all, we're made out of protein, right? My hair, you know, your fingernails, skin, red blood cells, hormones, enzymes, everything's kind of made out of this um, protein. So it's absolutely necessary for proper growth and development. Um, and then of course, high quality protein, which are the ones that I have listed on the screen are the ones that contain all of the essential amino acids. And that means that they are all needed in order to build a new, um, whatever it is that the body wants to build an enzyme, a hormone, a hair cell or, or muscle mass. Um, I can tell you that most athletes and students and even clients that I work with are getting adequate protein. What, what's sometimes not happening is 
how the protein is consumed. So how is it spaced throughout the day? And for athletes, there is um, some science behind when to eat protein, how much protein eat one time to build the, uh, to help build lean muscle mass, um, and then just support your overall growth and development. Okay, next slide, we're talking about fats. Um, again, fat is another energy source of the body. Um, it's essential for cellular growth. Also, um, some foods have essential fatty acids, um, which are necessary for, for you know, the body to survive. Um, this fat really is more of a fuel source for like lower to moderate intensity activity. So kind of thinking as we, I sit here, I'm using carbs and fat to fuel me um, a very small amount because I'm not doing much. But if I would get up and walk around, I would also be using carbs and fat. And then if I would start to jog, I would also be using carbs and fat for energy. It's not until I would start to sprint, like full out sprint, that the body says, eh, can't really use fat for energy right now. So I'm going to switch and only be able to use carbohydrates, which is why both of these fuel sources are important. Um, if you think about like basketball or hockey, when an athlete is, you know, kind of skating using both, but then there's an all out sprint or a lot of stop and move movements. The body is able to use a higher percentage of fat during like steady state running, jogging, but during a sprint, it, it, the fat, the, the ability to use fat for energy is lower and more carbohydrates are needed. So fat is also um, helps with thermoregulation. So temperature control, if it, when, when body fat percent gets too low, it really can negatively impact someone's health. Um, it, can, it can impact the ability to stay warm. It also um, is important to cushion and protect organs. Um, and in terms of food, it adds flavor. So you have a bagel, put some butter on it, you know, it adds a little bit of flavor. Um, fat is found naturally in many foods like avocados, cheese, eggs. So those are some like cheese and eggs, for example, are protein foods, but they also naturally have fat in them. And then some foods um, are predominantly fat, like oils and butters, um, you know, salad dressings. So when you're looking at building healthy meals, you're looking ideally at build, combining all of these nutrients into in, at one time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just give an example of that here because I wanna kind of show you, because remember this is day-to-day -day nutrition. This is what students and student athletes need to be doing every day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. How to build balanced meals. Well, think about where is my car source of carbohydrate? Where is my source of protein, high quality protein? And then do I have a little bit of dietary fats in here as well? And so this is kind of an example. If I'm building um, a breakfast, I might have, uh, I'm going to look for my nutrient rich carbohydrates. And in this example, I have oatmeal and some fresh fruit. I'm going to look for my high quality protein. In this example, I stir in a little bit of um, Greek yogurt. I also make it with milk. And then I wanna make sure that I have some fat. So I top it with some crushed walnuts and sliced almonds. And the, the outcome of that is this, this balanced meal that has carbs, proteins, and fats, and then has a wide variety of vitamins and minerals because the, the, if, you, if you're getting carbs, proteins, and fats in your meal, you, you can kind of know that you're getting a wide variety of vitamins and minerals. So that's what is important for all meals. So that's a breakfast example, but ideally doing the same thing at lunch, doing the same thing at dinner, and even whenever you build snacks. You know, if you eat an apple, what could I eat with this apple to get some protein and fats? Well, maybe you have it with a piece of cheese, or maybe you have it with some nut butter, um, or even a half a sandwich. Carbs, carbohydrates are the bread, you know, put a slice of turkey on there and some cheese, that's your protein and fat. So really how can you build those balanced meals throughout the day so that you're getting enough nutrients for health, growth and development? Okay, next slide. Okay, so moving on to sports nutrition. So once you have your your day to day nutrition, which by the way, if you to answer that on um, the polling question, you were correct, because Day-to-day -day nutrition is what keeps you healthy, feeling good, feeling energized, and prevents nutrient deficiencies. So you, you know, even though what you eat before is super important, you can't eat a crappy diet every day and then eat the perfect pre-exercise meal 
and think that you're going to perform the best. It just doesn't work that way. One of the reasons why is because nutrient deficiencies do not happen overnight. So you have to eat like be missing key nutrients every day, day after day, day after day. And eventually they're going to impact, um, you know, whatever it is that that nutrient impacts, for example, you know, iron deficiency, you might feel tired, but it doesn't happen overnight. So making sure to get valuable, um, nutrition each day. And then as a student athlete, taking it to the next level. So, so sports nutrition is about adding in extra carbs, protein, and fats to support training and competitions. Um, it also can be about supporting individual goals. Like if I have an athlete that wants, you know, they, he says, I want to build more muscle mass because I need to be more competitive on the ice for hockey. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I want to gain some weight. How can we support those particular goals? And some of it's training, of course, but then sports nutrition is going to support that training. So adding in extra fluids because athletes are going to train and compete and therefore they're going to sweat. Um, and then sweat is actually fluid loss from the body. It's also, um, can, you can also lose um, electrolytes. So needing, using, including extra electrolytes to maintain fluid balance. And then the last thing that um, is involved in sports nutrition is really considering what you eat but also when you eat it. Because remember, sports nutrition is about supporting training and competition. So you can't just add more carbs or add tons of protein um, without really kind of being mindful about when you're going to have it and why you're doing it. So there has to be a little bit purposeful. Okay, next slide. Okay, polling question number two. What is the most vital nutrient for student athletes? You know what you guys think, carbohydrates, protein, fat, or fluid? One, yes, there we go. Do we have any coming in? Yeah. They're okay. thinking, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see the um, yeah. results, so. Okay. I'll, when we're done, I'll end it and share it. So then you okay. can see it. I'm gonna wait a little bit more. There's one of our panelists that can't participate in the poll, but. She chose D as her answer. So that'll go up a little. Okay. <laughs> Some people are changing their answers. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for the minute to. All right, I'm gonna end and share results. So I think okay. you should be able to see them. Awesome. All right, so 14% carbohydrate. 29% protein, 0% fat, and 57% fluid. So nobody's thinking fat's the most important nutrient, but we've got kind of a lot of different results for the other. So let's, let's move to the next slide where I will just give you the answer. And it is water um, or fluid, I guess, is the most vital nutrient for student athletes. And it really is because um, a, even a small loss of body fluid is going to negatively impact performance. And in younger athletes, um, in teenage athletes, we, the, the thought is that it occurs even sooner, even with a 1% um, loss of body fluid. So really this is just losing a few pounds, um, you know, for somebody that's, you know, 130 pounds, losing like, you know, two to three pounds of weight can really negatively impact um, performance. And you might not say, oh, I have no idea how much I lose. This would require you to really like pay attention to the, your weight before and after, which we don't typically have athletes do Doing, but the important thing is to consider, am I, you know, am I a heavy sweater? Um, am I a salty sweater? And just kind of self-evaluate that and make sure you're getting adequate um, fluids throughout the day. Okay, next slide. I just want to talk about um, why, you know, why is this important? So dehydration, so there's levels of dehydration, right? There's this like 1% loss of body fluids where you might not, um, 
be developing like full blown headaches or some athletes don't even develop a thirst at this level, but dehydration really impacts the, the cardiovascular system, thermoregulation, and then um, central fatigue. So yes, it can have really like dangerous um, effects where it's really stressing out the cardiovascular system, even leaving, you know, if you're exercising in like hot and humid weather, even leading to like heat stroke and, and you know, even worse. Um, but most, the most common um, aspect or negative aspect that water is going, that dehydration can cause from an athlete's perspective is this perceived exhaustion. Um, you feel tired right? Unable to perform. And it's not typically going to happen in the beginning of, um, of practice or training or competition, unless you're really starting at a, a poor with a poor hydration state. Typically this occurs, you know, after an hour of going. So you're going, you started, maybe you started and you didn't really hydrate right during the day. You're not hydrating during, and all of a sudden you just feel really exhausted. Um, you want to sit down um, or you just don't feel like you can skate as fast or run as fast or keep up. These are, um, these are things that really can impact how well you perform and how well, you know, you, your actual um, sports performance overall is, but it also can affect your health significantly. So number one, vital nutrient is fluid. And I can tell you from working one-on-one -on -one with athletes that a lot of athletes are not paying attention to their fluid intake like they should be. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm just giving you the requirements. And so daily recommended intakes, um, you know, nine to, for the age of nine to 13 is um, 10 cups for males, nine cups for females. And then the older ages, eight, 14 to 18, 14 cups for males and 10 cups for females. Now that is the, the recommended daily intake. So that is not just like water, but that's you know fluid intake in general. And that's for everyone. That's for, for anybody in that age group, even a non-athlete. Athletes need additional fluids. And that's because you are losing fluid through sweat. So every time, even, First, you have to get these recommended da daily intakes, and then above that, you have to get the additional to support and make up for what you lost. So how do you do that? Well, really, you have to start really early in the morning. As soon as you wake up, grab a, a glass of water. Start right away. The, the, if you wake up and drink a, a cup of water right from the get-go, you've already set yourself up for, for hydration success. And then fill up a water bottle, take it with you, and then just sip on it all day long. Um, for sure, start all activity well hydrated. This can be a challenge for um, athletes that have morning practice. Like I know swimmers sometimes will have like a morning practice. <coughs> Swimmers also um, struggle to be able to, you know, take those uh, as many fluid breaks during activity, but drinking four to eight ounces of fluid every 15 to 20 minutes is also going to help you to stay hydrated while you're doing activity. And then after activity, you're, you have to rehydrate and make up. So the, the recommendations are to drink two cups for every pound lost. Now, if you know what your um, sweat rate is and you have this all calculated because you've been working with a sports dietitian, then you know you would know exactly how much to drink. Most, most athletes don't. So just drink a lot, right? After activity, say, if, especially if you're a really heavy sweater, get your water bottle and start chugging. Um, in general, one gulp of fluid is one ounce. So even during activity, run over to the sidelines, four gulps, that's probably around four ounces. It makes it really easy. What you don't want to do is not hydrate all day long. And then one hour before a competition say, oh my gosh, I haven't had enough fluid today and chug, you know, 24 ounces of water. Because what's going to happen if you do that is you're probably just going to have to go to the bathroom during the competition. Because the, when you, when you um, consume fluid really quickly, the body doesn't have a chance to really use it as it should. And instead, it increases urine output. Um, and especially for athletes that are wearing heavy equipment or, you know, they don't have access to a restroom right there. It's, you know, not something that you want to do. So start early, hydrate all throughout the day often, and then make sure to follow these special recommendations for before, during, and after. Okay, next slide. 
I gotta speed up because I'm I'm I got, I'm gonna not make it through my slides. Okay, so how can student athletes meet their increased energy and fluid needs? So you know you need more fuel and you need more fluids. So again, start drinking early. Make sure that um, to eat those balanced your regular meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Pack a mini meal or snack for after school, or especially athletes that go directly from school to um, practice after school, or if you go to a competition from school, like the bus is leaving from school, you don't have a chance to come home, you've really got to be prepared. Um, I could tell you for working with student athletes, the busiest people in the world, like you guys are all day at school, practices, training, competitions, homework, social obligations, like life is like, you got a lot going on. And so adding on it, like, being at home, like cooking and preparing your meals, kind of challenging, right? So thinking about things that are easy to prepare, that are portable, that you could take with you, keep in your backpack, even if it's like, you know, you put it in today and you eat it on Wednesday, um, things that are like very easy and they last. Um, have a carbohydrate rich snack 30 to 30 to 60 minutes before activity. And that's so that you can really remember fill up those muscles with carbohydrates so that you can um, have a little extra for, for your competition. Um, fuel and hydrate during as needed and then rehydrate and refuel after. So I'm just gonna go through that, then you can move to the next slide. The rest are really just examples of foods that you can consume. So these are some portable snacks, um, crunchy snacks like pretzels, um, peanut butter and jelly, yogurt cups, chocolate milk, bottled juices, granola bars, bagels, crackers, fruits. Um, if you can make a wrap sandwich, a cold pasta salad with beans in it, tuna packs, and hard boiled eggs. These are all things that you can pack and take with you. So some of them are shelf stable and others might require you to get a little portable cooler with an ice pack. But again, these are ways for you to make sure you have fuel for, um, for, for the whole day if you really need it. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> right before um, training or practice, I was mentioning topping off. We call it topping off glycogen stores. And that's really just adding in simple carbohydrates that, that will not stink in your stomach for a long time, right? Because you don't want to have, you don't want to have a, a lot of dietary fats right before training because it takes longer to digest. So this is the time to just have simple carbs, banana, fig newtons, some toast with jelly, um, granola bar, or some granola with fruit. These are um, some examples of that. And then next slide, these are um, going to be things to have during um, training, water, um, so a sports drink. A sports drink is going to have a little bit of carbohydrate, fluid, and electrolytes. All the things that you're losing by sweating and using fuel during training or competition. Dried fruits are also um, easy to eat and portable. Um, fresh fruit, like I know athletes will sometimes cut up like oranges or, you know, even a banana. And then one that a lot of don't, don't think about is like a baked sweet potato or a potato that's diced. Um, if you are okay with eating it cold and then putting some salt on it, because again, we're trying to replace fluid losses, electrolyte losses, and that, that main electrolyte that's being lost in sweat is sodium. Um, and so by, by having a, these little things, we're also, you know, providing a little bit of fuel. And then next slide is what to um, eat after training, practice, and competition. So after you have depleted your, uh, your carbohydrate stores, um, and you are, you know, reaching that level of, of low fluid status. So it's all about replacing um, yogurt with granola and fruit. Again, carbs, proteins, and some you can you can have a little fat after. Um, you can have a lot of fat after. It just depends on the meal. But the idea here is to replace carbohydrates, give a little protein, and replace fluids and electrolytes. Chocolate milk is kind of like known as a recovery beverage. And that's because it's super simple and it's everything that you need in one beverage. So chocolate milk has carbs, protein, it's also a fluid, and then it also has electrolytes. So by, you know, I, I like to recommend the, um, the shelf stable ones to athletes. Um, there's a couple brands that have them. You can put it in a backpack and it's something that right when you're done, you can just, you know, drink and then go home and have your meal whenever you get there. Energy bites are also great, but you know, you have to make them, you have to be prepared or buy them. 
Um, a smoothie is another great option, but again, you have to have access to a, a blender um, or take a sandwich, you know, even a half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a half a turkey sandwich, it just depends on how prepared you are. Okay, next slide. I'm sharing a few salty foods because um, again, I really always worry about um, young athletes, student athletes that are really heavy sweaters and salty sweaters. Like replacing sodium in, in fluids is, is critical, not just for health, but for performance. But afterwards, I mean, it really is a, is a health risk if you deplete of these um, items. So making sure to have some salty foods throughout the day, if you are a salty sweater. Um, and I just wanted to share some examples. So noodle soup, which also has carbs and fluid, some salty pretzels, olives and pickles are super high in salt, and then crackers that are salted. Okay, next slide. Okay, I want to make sure that I leave enough time for questions. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip through these. I actually, there's a handout that you'll all get. Um, and, and both of these meal pattern examples are on your handout. So basically, I'm showing you an example of how to eat um, or when to eat if you have, if you go straight from school to, to practice. And so, um, and then you have sports practice here from 3.30 to 5.30. And then the next slide is a second meal pattern example. And this is basically if you have a, a game like later in the evening. So at three o'clock you go home from school, you have dinner, um, then you have like a little snack and then you have like a game or competition from seven to nine and then how you would rehydrate and, and eat later in the evening. So it's, it's all about being flexible. So everybody's schedule is different. Everybody's practice times are different. Everybody's competition times are different. And sports nutrition is about being flexible around those times so that you're eating at the right time and you're eating the right things. Okay, next slide. Um, this last thing I wanna touch on is there's three nutrients of, of high concern for, for student athletes that I just wanted to make sure I mentioned. And they are calcium and vitamin D. I'll talk about these first on this slide. And my, my take home message here is to make sure that you're including enough calcium and vitamin D to build a strong skeleton that to really support and withstand your, your training practice and your, your um, rigorous competition and training schedule. So think about it. Calcium and vitamin D is needed to build to to um, build and repair bones, like maintain your bones. Your whole skeleton is is dependent on calcium and vitamin D. And I don't I don't see too many athletes come to me for sports nutrition for broken bones, but I get a ton for fractures and repeated fractures. And I'm always looking at vitamin D status and levels and what foods they're consuming to make sure that their calcium and vitamin D intake is appropriate to support um, healthy bones. So I, I share the recommended intake there, but also looking at calcium rich foods would be things like dairy foods, calcium fortified soy milk, um, sardines, tofu, salmon, a little bit in spinach, not a lot. You know, If you don't eat dairy foods, you're kind of, um, you're really going to need to pay attention, but dairy foods are a very rich source of calcium. Vitamin D, there's not a lot of foods that have vitamin D. So milk, vitamin D fortified milk is the, um, the best um, source of vitamin D or, or milk. So they uh, fortified soy milk as well. So a, a little bit of vitamin D and some other foods, but it's, it's really the best source. And which is why I'm really um, look at student athletes meal plans. And I'm like, okay, are, are we getting enough of these two nutrients? So pay attention to those. Next slide. The last one I want to mention is iron. So again, include enough iron rich foods to maintain iron stores and appropriate level to maximize endurance capacity and maintain a healthy immune system. So iron is one of those nutrients that it, it doesn't happen overnight. If you don't get enough iron today or tomorrow, you're not going to go iron deficient. You have to not get enough iron every day for like months. And then what happens is all of a sudden you feel the effects, right? You don't feel the effects the first week. You just get, um, it's not even a fatigue. Typically athletes will come to me and say, I can't run as fast as I did last year. 
I can't swim as fast as I did last year. Why am I not able to finish a 5K at the same level that I did last year? And if it's a 5K or a sprint, it's not typically carbohydrates because it's not a long distance race. We dig really deep and find it like something like an iron deficiency and, and which can really impact um, sports performance. And it, unfortunately you can't, you can't fix it um, overnight either. So you can't just start taking iron or start eating iron rich foods and expect to be better in a week. It really does take months to restore iron status to normal. And, you know, I've seen that really be um, entire, you know, years of, of an athlete. So, you know, their freshman year, great. Uh, sophomore year, doing great. Junior year, what's going on? I can't figure this out. And then we figure it out. And then, you know, maybe we can get them back up to par their senior year. So there are some really, you know, important things to pay attention to food sources, meats, um, beans, lentils, spinach, tofu, you know, number one source I would recommend is iron fortified cereals um, because it's easy, right? So I know like, I love bran flakes, one of my favorite foods. And one cup of bran flakes um, has 100% of the recommended intake for iron in a day. Um, it's plant-based, so it's not quite as absorbed as well as the meats, but it's still a good source. So again, just pay attention to some of these um, nutrients. If you're eating a healthy, balanced breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, you should be able to get all the vitamins and minerals you need. But if you eliminate food groups or you're really kind of like, going, well, I get a good lunch and I get a good dinner, but breakfast is, and I really don't pay attention to snacks. You know, that's when you start to have to worry about some of these individual nutrients. So last slide. That's it. I'm done. Um, I don't even know if I have time for questions because I kind of ran over. I was trying to get through that fast, but um, you have my email and you know ways to connect with me if you have questions. Um, but if I have time, I'd love to take some if you have any. We have time for a few questions. Okay. Erica's, Erica, our next presenter is here, but if people have questions, we're good. Anyone? Let me see here. Nothing in the chat yet. Any questions for? It was so comprehensive. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad that. Yeah. No. And I will. I will share your handout. Okay. Uh, yep. And I do have. I mean, there's a, a lot of that information, especially the food examples that I find like students are looking for. Like, just you know, help me. You know, those are one, some of the most common questions I get are like help me get ideas. So I included some of those on the handout as well. Right, I just typed my email address into the chat. Um, so anybody that's on, I know quite a few people that are on as attendees, but some of the kids' names I don't know. So okay. email me and uh, I can definitely get you the handout that Heather has prepared. Likewise, we are recording this and I will be sending this out to all athletic directors at some point you know, to share out um, question for you from one of our athletic directors. I am wondering about athletes who might have lactose intolerance. What suggestions would you have? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, well, so there's levels, right? So some definitely, if you have lactose intolerance, it's kind of a misconception that you can't have any dairy at all. Like you, a lot of, um, individuals that have lactose intolerance can tolerate some dairy, particularly, um, like the heavy, the hard cheeses, yogurt, those tend to be um, tolerated. There's also, if, if milk is a problem, there's lactose-free milk. Um, and then there's also like A2 milk that tends to be tolerated a little bit more. And I find that it's sometimes um, quantity at once. So like I have students that will have, that have lactose intolerance, that they're totally fine with putting Greek yogurt in a smoothie and like a quarter cup of milk, but if they drink a milkshake, they're, they're gonna have major, major problems and symptoms. Um, even some can not drink like a full cup of regular cow's milk, but they're okay with lactose-free milk, um, but they can tolerate small amounts like milk mixed into oatmeal is okay because of the, it's co combined. So it, you know, it's really about before you eliminate completely, try, decreasing the amount that you consume at one time of those lactose, um, high lactose foods. And then if, 
if that's still problematic, then you can move to the, um, you know, I, I mean, cheese and yogurt is, is really um, highly tolerated um, by those with lactose intolerance. So those, that, that would be, you know, trying to maintain some level of high good calcium sources. Um, but then, you know, again, there's lo lots of lactose free options out there as well. Another question here, what are some of the most common deficiencies that you see in student athletes? So I just named them. That's why I always, I like to talk about them just because those are the ones that I personally, as a sports dietitian, see the most iron deficiency um, and vitamin D deficiency. I mean, there's really no, unfortunately, I can't really measure calcium deficiency because the body, even if you get, you know, your calcium levels checked, the, the body has a, is really, really efficient at keeping blood calcium levels normal, but it will keep blood calcium levels normal at the expense of bones. So your, your bone is made up of 99% calcium. It's, that's where it's stored. And then there's 1% kind of, you know, in the rest of the body. So the, the, your bloodstream will keep that at a, at a, you know, normal level at the expense of not, um, you know, contributing to bones to make them harder. So then we start to see bone density issues. Now, some student athletes will eventually, if they're having repeated fractures over and over, their doctor might recommend like a bone density test. And then that's kind of like evidence that like, okay, you're not getting enough calcium, vitamin D. Um, but without that, there's no, um, you know, it really doesn't show up all the time. Vitamin D you, is something that you can check. It's a blood test and I see vitamin D deficiency a, a lot, not to say a lot. So those are the those are the two most common. Um, because because student athletes have high energy needs, like calorie needs, the the consumption of food that's needed is so wide. Is, you know, it's so great that you should be able to get your nutrient, vitamin, and minerals through diet. The real problems come when you are on a special diet or you've decided to cut out a certain food group or I'm not gonna eat this food or that food, but I'm gonna eat this food because a lot of times what I find is students will eliminate a food but they don't really think about the nutrient that they're eliminating in that food. So if you have, or if you're following a special diet or if you um, you know, are, have a limited diet, then there's other ones, you know, B12, um, is probably one of the other ones, like a lot of students aren't getting enough potassium. Some of these don't show up um, in performance. They're affecting health, but they don't necessarily show up in performance for someone to come see a dietitian. Heather, thank you very much. You're um, welcome. One last question. Okay. Do you have concerns about processed high empty calorie foods? Many processed foods also contain preservatives and high sugar content, so. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, this is a really like, you know, popular topic. In fact, I, I, I actually wrote in my book about like sports drinks. Now sports drinks have sugar and I was writing about the nutrient needs of athletes. And I actually had someone say to me, how could you possibly as a, as an expert in this recommend sugar to an athlete? And my response to that is, Athletes need a high amount of carbohydrates, depending on, you know, level of, of expenditure. But if you're a 17 year old athlete and you are, you know, training two hours a day, there is not, it's not possible for you to eat all of your carbohydrate or get all of your carbohydrate intake through vegetables and whole foods. Like it, you, the amount of food that's needed to, to, to fuel that, that level of training is so high, which is why products like sports gels that are sugar or sports drinks that have sugar or, um, you know, fig Newtons, that are you know kind of processed are are developed and and made for athletes because we're we're really we're not we're not giving sugar to someone who's um, you know sitting on their couch and and not doesn't have high carbohydrate needs we're really in, in in low nutrients my concern with processed foods and high sugar foods would be if you don't eat nutritious foods and instead eat only processed and high sugar foods because then you can not meet your vitamin and mineral requirements, so right? So you get all these carbohydrates that you need, but you don't get vitamins and minerals. 
But for student athletes, because their nutrition needs are so high, if you eat a nutritious foundation, so you eat a healthy breakfast, lunch, dinner, and some snacks, you can meet your vitamin and mineral requirements through that. And then everything above and beyond that is specifically to fuel that training and competition or that added energy expenditure. And that is extra carbs. We're not saying athletes really don't have like a higher potassium need or a higher vitamin A need. They have the same exact vitamin and mineral requirements for most nutrients that non-athletes do. What they need more of is carbs, proteins, and fats. So these foods are found in, um, you know, they're found in simple sugars. So honey and, and maple syrup. And sometimes I do have to recommend that athletes with high needs add these to their foods just so they can get enough energy um, to, to reach their goals. So, I mean, if that makes sense. So it's not like I'm recommending them um, in terms of like, I, it's okay to have just endless, you know, sugars. It's, it, it, you really have to get that foundation of a healthy diet first and get your vitamins and minerals that you need, but getting more vitamins and minerals isn't, doesn't give you an added benefit or advantage. You have to meet your recommended daily needs and then, and then you're, you're good. Right. And then you can have these extra um, carbs, proteins, and fats specifically to fuel training and competition. Heather, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend with us. Yep. Um, and I will, I will share your handout and your email. And I know you have to uh, head out for another obligation. So at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Hannah Dykins. Hannah is a student athlete from Pittsburgh Central School District, and she serves on the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and she's gonna introduce our next speaker, Erica Ebert. So go ahead, Hannah. Hello, I have the pleasure of introducing Erica Ebert. Erica Ebert is a highly experienced educator, professional development specialist, and national presenter on exploring and implementing mindfulness in an educational setting. Erica began her career as a high school English teacher and was named Teacher of the Year at Highland Park High School in Dallas, Texas. Erica's interest in mindfulness meditation began in 2006 when she became a yoga instructor and trainer with American Power Yoga in Dallas, Texas. In 2009, after a weekend training with Pima Chodron, she was hooked. Erica has taught yoga and meditation for 15 plus years and is an expert in mindfulness for students ages 14 through 18 and adults. She's a level two mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher through Brown University. Erica is also a graduate of Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield's Mindfulness Meditation Teacher Training. She is the founder and co-owner of the Balanced Living Center, as well as the staff development trainer in social and emotional learning and mindfulness for Wayne Finger Lakes BOCES. She loves working with student athletes and coaches throughout Section 5. Welcome, Erica. Hannah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, how's everyone doing? I know this is like a, a, an interesting way to do this because I can't see everyone's face on here, but it's it's nice to uh, it's nice to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, I actually wanted to start out, and I don't know if this is possible. So Kathy, if it's not, just let me know. Um, does everyone on here have the availability to chat or no? Yes, they can chat or they can put it in the question answer. So okay. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So if you need to ask questions, they can type into the chat. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to start off with, um, as an athlete or um, a coach, whoever whoever is on here, someone who works with athletes, or if you are one, um, what is something that you think, if you could train your brain to do this, it would be incredibly helpful for you? So like, for example, if you could train your brain to let go of mistakes, that would be really helpful for you. If you could train your brain to um, anything of that nature, if you could train your brain, support you as an athlete, what would you want to train your brain to do? Like taking your brain to the gym. Uh, yeah, cool. So right now in the chat, somebody typed in there, let go of mistakes for sure. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's probably a common one for all of us. I'm sure that is. I'll wait and see if anything else comes in. Yeah. Also replace negative thoughts with positive self-talk, which... Awesome. Those two kind of go together, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I just see it says Kay Crosby. So whatever your first name is, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'll just wait a moment um, to see if anything else comes in. Um, Hannah asked, you know, 
focus faster than normal. So oh. being able to, you know, align and focus quickly. It's Great. Carrie Crosby. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> um, stay focused on the goal, regardless of the adversity that you're challenged with. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. I'll wait just a moment and see. Uh, Bridget, yeah, not let mistakes affect me. I can, I get that too. Or others, I'll, I'll throw that in, not let mistakes affect me or others around me, right? In a team sport. Yeah, absolutely. Being kind, a good sport while still, still being competitive. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. These are awesome. Let them define me. Yeah, okay. This is great and I appreciate this. Um, and the good news is, is that you absolutely can train your brain for that. I have um, spoken on this topic before and whether it's for athletes or um, whatever it is that you're engaging is, let me start with this term and it's called neuroplasticity. The term neuroplasticity means that what you practice becomes stronger. So as athletes, you um, obviously work out, you, you take your, your muscles into the gym and do things. Well, the practice of mindfulness meditation is a way to take your brain to the gym and to work that out. But it's got to be something um, that you do on a, on a regular basis, truly, for it to have an impact. So what you put into the chat, um, let me just address those. And, and I want to actually begin with what Hannah brought up, the focusing faster than, than normal. So there's a practice in mindfulness meditation that's called anchoring. And anchoring is a practice where you um, practice giving your attention to one thing. And so that one thing can be practicing giving your attention to sounds you hear around you. It can be practicing giving your attention to your breathing. Let's just go with those two for right now. And this might not seem like something that directly relates, Hannah, to what you said, but it's a way of being able to actually direct your attention on purpose to something. So over time, the more you practice giving your attention, let's say to sound, if you just took two minutes a day, right? And for two minutes a day, you said, all I'm going to do right now is listen to all of the sounds that I hear around me. Now, your mind is busy. Our mind's job is to think. That's what the mind does. It thinks. And I know if you're anything like me, you probably can get very lost in your thinking, right? Get kind of swept away by that. But if you take your brain to the gym in this way and you give it something to do and you say for two minutes, I am only going to hear sounds around me. For two minutes, I'm only gonna focus on my breathing. That is a very easy strategy that over time, you can increase the time, but more importantly than increasing the time that you do it is actually doing it more often. So if you did that daily, it has a lasting impact more than it would if you did it for say 20 minutes, just once a week. It's better to take your brain to the gym once a day and do it in that way with anchoring. So that's something that I like to offer. It's a pretty simple practice um, and it definitely, Hannah, helps focusing. And for any of you that are interested in, in being able to give your attention to something, um, that is the way to practice doing that. I wanna go now to what Mark said because it also kind of goes directly into, into this, to stay focused on the goal regardless of adversity. Um, in many ways, there, there has to be a practice of staying focused on one thing. And that's the way that I like to word that, as opposed to ignoring, or when we get that kind of language of, oh, just forget that happened, that's not easy to do, right? That's not something that's actually even possible. Because if you give your attention to, um, if you give your attention to not paying attention to it, you're paying attention to it. And so what needs to happen is, let's say we're in that place of adversity, which is pretty uncomfortable, right? There's this practice of how can I continually give my attention to what I'm doing despite how I'm feeling? So the practice for that would be to, let's just say, um, 
in a, in a physical workout practice, you put yourself in, I'll call it plank pose, right? So like the top of a push up where your arms are straight and you're in this kind of struggling place. And if you keep yourself in that struggling place and you give your attention to your breathing, you'll hit a point pretty quickly um, where you start to get very uncomfortable. But let's say we've set a goal of staying in this pose in this challenging physical space for a minute and a half. Your brain and your mind will usually give out faster than your body does. And so the practice of staying present to, wow, this is uncomfortable, but I'm going to stay here and I'm going to stay focused on the goal. Maybe the time is up in front of us. We're going to stay focused on doing this for a minute and a half. It's getting your nervous system in a space where it doesn't go directly into flight, fight, freeze. It doesn't just head, you know, head spin into like, I got to get out of here. Because the challenge, Mark, when you bring that up of staying focused during adversity is not so much the focus, it's the discomfort of what's going on. That leads pretty directly into um, what came up a lot is how do I replace negative thoughts with positive? How do I let go of the mistakes that I made? And again, we've all given this pretty bad advice of just let that go, <laughs> you know, that's not something to do. We have to have what I like to call a replacement behavior. You have to have something to do. And so in your practices, this just won't show up in a game, right? It's like if you just went and played the game without the physical practice, you're not gonna ever really do that. So the mental part has gotta be intermingled with that. Let's say you make an error in a, in a practice, which is totally something that happens, of course. When you make that error, the practice has to be immediate of what are you saying to yourself? For example, I worked with a, a golfer, um, full uh, transparency, I don't golf, but I can do this part. So I worked with a golfer and when she would make an error, I would make her say these things out loud to me, what she was saying to herself. She was like, I don't, I don't wanna say that out loud because she's very critical of herself. I would guess that if um, I could see you all on the screen right now and I asked how many of you are more critical of yourself than kind to yourself, my guess would be that most of you like me are more critical of yourself. So this inner critic, this voice that comes up that talks to us, it's pretty negative, um, is something we have a negativity bias, right? That's just a natural way of being. We have that in our brains. So when I worked with this golfer and I would make her say these things out loud, over time, she started to realize how she was like, um, you know, you, you want a cheerleader in your head? She was just like this like very negative coach in her head. And it made her question herself as an athlete, made her not trust herself as much. And so the practice of saying out loud the things you're saying to yourself about yourself and then replacing those words with something more neutral or positive. So this part also feels really awkward because we're not used to saying kind things to ourselves. And the more we practice saying kind things to ourselves, being a more positive type of coach for ourselves, the more we build that ability in the brain to have a pathway that's not so critical. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the point of all of this is, is that the mindfulness practice brings to our awareness how often our mind wanders. And that's why we have to practice paying attention. It brings into our awareness how often we like to get away from things that are uncomfortable. And so we practice being in discomfort. And it also brings into our awareness the voice in our head. I think that's one of the biggest things. I think the voice in our head and the negativity that that can cause is one of the biggest things that we deal with as humans and as athletes. Because somewhere along the line, we believed that if we continually beat ourselves up, we were just going to get better. But what research actually shows is that the more compassionate you are for yourself, the more resilient you become. So that might feel like, ah, that, that doesn't make sense to me. I need that harshness. But every ounce of research out there from mind scans and fMRI scans shows that the more we practice being kind, the more resilient we are. So that was fast and furious because I wanted to leave some time and I'm seeing something pop into the chat, but I wanted to leave some time 
um, for, for questions. Yeah, it is being recorded for that. Um, so let me pause because I don't want to run out of time with that. And then I can go back to, I could talk about this forever. So, um, are there any questions right now that are coming up from the anchoring, the practicing of focusing from the practicing of discomfort, um, or from that, you know, awareness of, I like to call it an inner critic. So I'll give some space and pause here and see if there's any questions that come up on that. Okay, so I guess the, the next piece is a question that I have for those of you that, that are here um, watching this right now. And if you are watching this in the future, it's, a, it's kind of a good maybe place to pause and, and really think about this. How willing are you to do the work of training the mind, right? So that's not something you can type that into the chat if you want to, but it's just more of a reflection like, the, the problem with this that I'll say is that we don't necessarily see the results right away, right? It's not a tangible result that we see. We don't see the muscles building in the body and we don't see ourselves skillfully getting better, um, except at some point we do. And so I have to highlight again, really, this, this notion that if we don't practice this, we do not get better at it. And so, excuse me. <clears throat> and so being able to um, sit every day for a few minutes and give your attention to breath or give your attention to sound might seem like it's not doing anything. And then all of a sudden you'll begin to realize like, oh, I do have the ability to shift my attention. When you put yourself in those challenging, um, physically challenging poses, you know, like I said, that plank pose or something physical. Over time, you start to build the ability of the nervous system to not have to run away so much from discomfort. And the more that you say out loud those words of that inner critic, over time, more and more, you realize, wow, I'm being kinder to myself in this. And so being able to give yourself the, the time and patience to do that work is incredibly important. I do want to speak just a little bit, and Kathy, you brought this up too, about um, working together as a team. Because one of the things, um, I don't know if anybody watched Ted Lasso, but I got obsessed with Ted Lasso. And, um, I, you know, the team at first was just not getting along. Oh, yay, Hannah. I love, isn't it amazing? It's so fun. So, you know, the team at first, first of all, they thought he was crazy, right? I won't give too much away if you haven't seen it. But they also... Um, they just did not get along and did not play well together because of that. And so what mindfulness also, um, um, what mindfulness really does for us is helps us become so self-aware, absolutely, Kathy, so self-aware that we begin to recognize how our feelings impact us and the way we interact with other people it really helps us to step into a place of um, emotional awareness. And sometimes, and hopefully gives us the courage to have conversations with each other about um, those things that are bothering us. I'm also going to assume that as members of teams, um, you definitely feel like you have conflict or issues with each other, right? And if those things over time are not discussed or talked about, they start to build. So mindfulness offers us many different practices and ways um, to do that together, to come together and to be able to say, let's just say Kathy was my teammate. I'm going to pick on her because her names are there and I know her, right? And I really wanted to share with her that something she was doing was upsetting me. Well, if I'm talking to everybody else but Kathy about it, over time, that's going to build an issue between us as a team. If I can find the courage and mindfulness and we can come to each other and I can say, Kathy, when you do this, it's very annoying. Now I said it, I feel great, but maybe the way Kathy receives it, it's hard to hear. And mindfulness would offer us this availability of, wow, I just got really upset when Erica said I was annoying. And we would start together to talk about 
how to work that out as a team. Now, I'm not trying to be um, like drip all these things and then not give you practices for it. But that piece of mindfulness, what it does for athletes and for teams, takes some time to build. At the end of the day, it begins very simply with the practices of practicing giving your attention to breath, getting to know your body and its discomfort and managing the thoughts in the mind. So um, <laughs> I will absolutely, in just a moment, I will lead you in a, in a mindfulness meditation, which I think would be awesome for sure. But Kathy, before I do that, I am gonna pause just one more time to see if there's any questions from any of the, the athletes who are on um, or any of the, um, coaches. Yeah. For people that are on that are coaches, um, as well, we have some ADs, um, right. Erica works here at Wayne finger, Lo finger Lake Spoces as a social emotional learning specialist. So, um, districts can, that are part of Wayne Finger Lake Spoces can utilize her services, um, yeah. which is awesome. And then yeah. other, other BOCES can cross contract. So, um, we have a great resource here. Thank you. Yeah, Sandra, be a goldfish, right? <laughs> so if you if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, that be a goldfish is exactly right. Like goldfish has a has a 10 second memory, right? Just let it go just and be that goldfish. Hannah, I love mindfulness apps. I think Headspace is awesome. 10% uh, Happier is great. Calm is a great app. What I really love about using apps is that they help guided meditation, right? And that's not like training wheels, right? That's like you have a coach. And I think that um, they offer like badges if you do things after a certain amount of time, right? It's like an incentive to do that. And so I definitely think that, that apps are wonderful. Any other questions? All right. So are we good for a little mindfulness meditation? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Sounds yeah. Good. Sounds good. So I'll invite you to, um, to come into a comfortable seated position. If it feels safe for you to have your eyes closed, go ahead and do that. If that doesn't feel right to you, you can just take your eyes down past the screen and just pause here for a moment. And in this pause, maybe you can relax your shoulders. Maybe you can unhinge the jaw. Soften the space in between the eyes. And just take a deeper breath in than you've been taking. And let a slower breath out. And do that again. Let the next breath you take be deeper than the breaths you've been taking. Sometimes the mind feels like a snow globe when it gets shaken up, right? And so mindfulness is not about emptying out the mind of thinking, not at all. What I'm gonna invite you to do is the practice of anchoring, the practice that I spoke about at the beginning and throughout, because those thoughts are there. What I would invite you to do right here is to start to give your attention to the sounds that you hear around you, whatever those sounds are. And the mind, of course, because this is what it does, it will drift away. That's why this is called an anchor. And when your mind begins to drift away, my suggestion is that you bring it back to the sounds you hear around you. Not forcefully but just with a kind voice that reminds you, right now we're just listening to the sounds around us.
and it's okay for the mind to drift. And every time it drifts, this is, this is the example I was sharing. This is like the, the bicep curl of the mind. When the mind drifts, you bring it back to what you hear around you. This is the practice of focusing our attention breath by breath. So just take a few more seconds right here in stillness and silence to listen. And then together, take a deeper breath in than you've been taking. And a longer breath out. And if the eyes have been closed, let them open. So that's an anchoring practice. That's the simplicity of the practice, although I know that that can maybe feel challenging to direct the attention because the mind does get busy. But that practice does so much. Um, in many ways, it starts to just ease us. It stops the swirling of thoughts. Um, it gives our mind something else to do. And hopefully that practice is in, in service of you and, and supportive. And also just notice and know that if you wanna begin a practice, like, like Hannah said, those apps are wonderful, but I'm also someone who you can reach out to um, to help you with that, with that mental wellness. So Kathy, anything else before I go? Oh, thank you, Erica. Very much appreciated taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. A great way to end. So uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. I know you have to knock off to another obligation. And so and we're, we're almost done here. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everyone. And Hannah, thanks again for introducing me. I appreciate it. Everyone be well. So to wrap up our workshop today. Um, I would like to share with you a quick video. Um, we started the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. We're in our third year. There's uh, four athletic directors and myself that act as uh, advisors to that group. We meet five or six times a year. Um, our, our first, our second group of student athletes graduated last year and I reached out to a couple of them and had them share with us some of their thoughts as they transitioned from high school academics and athletics to college. And so at this time, uh, we're going to share a video with you um, from one of our athletes, um, Hope Harrison from Byron Virgin, who is now at Columbia University in New York City as an engineering major. I think Sean is going to be able to help us with showing that video.
not sure if it, not sure if everybody could hear that. I apologize. I know myself and anybody else who's a panelist could not. Um, I'd like to say thanks to everybody in attendance today. Appreciate it. Um, we will uh, process the recording and share it out um, with people in attendance. Um, I know many of you that are in attendance. If you're someone that uh, needs to send me your email address so we can share the recording with you, please do so. Um, and again, thank you for attending and have a great day.